Let's come a little chart to try. Great. So welcome. Good afternoon, everybody, and good morning for those folks living on the East Coast or in the United States, I should say, in general. Uh, welcome to our third of seven virtual workshop trainings on trail uh, design, interpretation, and construction. Uh, I believe most, if not all of you, heard from our wonderful guest speaker yesterday, Ray Bloomer, who talked about accessibility issues when it comes to designing uh, trails and the like. And that was just very information, or informative, but also very inspirational as well. It was very credible uh, coming from, from Mr. Bloomer, who is blind himself. So thank you for joining us yesterday. Um, I'm not going to take up much more of our time because uh, Andrea has a full session ahead of her. So with no further ado, again, just want to welcome everybody back. And I will pass it over to Pata for some brief opening remarks, and then we'll hear from Andre again. So thank you, and happy Friday. Thank you, thank you, Ethan. Moge salmevit, vagzelip, tren saulebas. Echla shevdi vart zalian, mishalovan satkot zonashi. Radesat usualut, unarev za ikhne vakide upromati akcenti, am sa interpretatio masalis momzadebashi. Drevandel Sesiado or Shabbatis Toka one to twenty Sour Jishur at Pedro Hesdaitz, Havazelet, no promet at Chavar to Vitkid. Madlot Andrea was just a few words about the what to expect, and now it's your turn to All right. start, start delivering. All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and I'm so glad you're back. Um, so today we're going to start looking at some non-personal services and of course that being wayside exhibits the main reason for this training as well as building the trail but before we do does anyone want to share their homework as to a theme related to either the wild goat or the forest uh, Tamar Kahidze wants to present. Yay! <laughs> well, I have written something, but I guess it's way too general. But anyway, I want to <laughs> read it so I can get comments from you. Go for it. Uh, well, uh, scent, scenery, and the sound of the forest. Uh, the forest uh, you are about to discover keeps numerous visible and invisible secrets for you. Uh, ground covered with soft grass is perfect for walking under the canopy of the various trees that create pleasant and cool atmosphere, especially in summer to hide away from the heat of the sun. You will also come across uh, uh, some brooks gargling between the rocks, reflecting sun rays filtering through the tree, tree leaves. This pristine forest is rich in flora with many species being endemic. Uh, its undergrowth uh, uh, represent habitat for various mammals uh, and crowns of the trees that are shelters for many bird species. As for the brooks, you can observe some uh, amphibian, amphibians here. Uh, keep coming back to see how the forest with its landscape and soundscape changes according to season, uh, from white to green, from green to colorful, from silent to pleasantly noisy. Being in the forest, feeling yourself as a part of the nature is the best for physical and mental well-being. Relax and fully sense a uh, scent, scenery and sound of the forest. Wow, you're hired. <laughs> 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 it was more than theme. It was this was a story. Story. Yes. Already. So she's already got her text. That's that's the homework for this weekend. So you jump the gun, which is is fine. It's very good. Um, but um, what did you think of her her interpretive writing? Who? Just the group in general. Do we have any uh, comments uh, from the? Es kit kot krengeche, but auditorias. Ratsecha moismine tamarizgan. Raz Rigavich, that Gardaim, Ketevan is Ada, Lawrence is a role of Cerebiatis, as you go regard. I'm jealous, first of all. And <laughs> congratulations, and I definitely want to go and visit that place. 
Thank you. And kind of experience that 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 wisdom, yeah, and mm. peace. Can I add as yes, well? Yes, please do. Uh, I um, wish to have, a, I mean, to add a bit for for four season because it's mainly focused for a summer to hide uh, from the sun, but we will have like um, autumn and the winter customers as well. So I will ask Tamar to just follow for four season just to add a bit in that case as well. Very good. I thought it was very inviting. It would do really well um, early in the trail to get people um, thinking about, you know, future visits and then the different seasons, but you, you write very well and it's very good interpretive writing and definitely hold on to it and um, bring it to the table when we start laying out the exhibits and then um, um, start out writing the text. Because interpretive text, you don't want it to be too flowery. Remember, we want to present the intellectual and then the emotional to allow the visitor to make their own connection. But that was very good. Anyone else want to go after that? Nina Mesavsky, Dev. Yes. Yeah, okay. Nino Gosha Trinkogi. How about Zane, Nino? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, can I share my screen? Uh, I have uh, prepared slides and uh, I would like to share. Do I have to give her permission or she can do that? Uh, I think I can do that. Uh, yeah. All right. Anybody should be able to do it, Andrea, from their okay. end. Okay. Great. All right. But just uh, one at so, a time. Uh, we worked as a group. Uh, our organization, um, like, did this uh, uh, together. So we uh, prepared uh, uh, this uh, story about East Caucasian tour. Uh, uh, if my uh, teammates uh, would like to add something that they're welcome to. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the uh, text uh, we prepared and uh, here are some um, tangible and intangible uh, things uh, that are um, Underlined uh, in the text. Um, uh, should I read aloud or I, I don't know? I, I think we can read. Um, I love how you identified the tangibles and the intangibles, and you have a nice balance. You have two of each, and um, you listed them up top first, which gave you a base to uh, to add your writing to. Um, the one thing too that a theme does is it allows you to double check. You know, am I still on track? Am I going off track? Is this adhering to the theme and telling the story? Because remember, your your audience only has limited time, and we're going to talk about that next. So they don't have much more than a few minutes to look at these and get the message. So if you break things down, rather than talking about the forest here, maybe we talked about that earlier on. Rather than talking about the birds here, we're going to talk about that later on. So this sticks to, and is the tur the goat? Am I correct in that? This tur? Yes, tur, yes, yeah. Tur, it's endem goat. Okay. Endemic goat. Right. So the only there's, thing. There's, there's, there's this late name, scientific name, copper cylindrical, cylindricornish. That's a scientific, scientific name. Right, got it. Latin name. Okay. So one thing I might suggest is um, when you introduce a term like ungulates, I think most of us that know nature and know biology know what that is, but you might want to describe that and use a different term or put it in parentheses. You know, these are um, hooved animals or whatever description, but for someone that is just arriving for the first time or has limited knowledge, um, they may not know what that means. So just be careful of your terminology. To, and it's fine to use more advanced terms. You just want to define them and explain them so people then have that information to move on. But very good. I think um, you think this is going to be one of the themes and one of the topics? Uh, I don't know yet. OK, well, from what I understand, it's a pretty big deal. So let's put a star on that one and make sure it comes to the yeah. table when it comes time to uh, doing the actual design. All right. Andrea? Yes. Um, this is Sandy. I, I also point out that um, I like the fact that at the bottom, uh, threats are identified. 
and I like the fact that you've done it in a different color, red, which it, to me, uh, it kind of indicates to stop or, uh, or danger, you know, pay attention. So I just point that out. I think that's a, a good piece also. I, I don't know what you think about that, Andrea. Yeah, I think if um, possibly that becomes one of the underlying uh, messages, which according to the scope of work, we want to mention hab habitat degradation and um poaching and all the other threats so <clears throat> excuse me so i think if on each of these on um, when we're talking about um the natural world plants and animals that that be listed from panel to panel i think that's very good thanks for bringing that up sandy um i i think it'd be really good to have that and if it applies to each of the panels but have it in the same place and um you know, have it, uh, I, I don't mind having it in red. I don't know how you guys feel about that. You know, red is usually the teacher's mark that you did something wrong. <laughs> is there any cultural issue issues or connotations in Georgian that would um, be an issue here? Or are we okay with using red? Oh, it's okay. It's uh, okay and it uh, like make sure that you pay attention to that particular part. It's kind of like, like warning uh, uh, color. It, it yeah. raises alerts, yeah. Alert, exactly. All right. Well. But also, I, I, I like, again, I agree this text is rich, very rich, and but I, I, I'm reading it with pleasure and I, I, it's very pleasant reading. It's well written. But also what I want to say at the end, she is, she is kind of emphasizing this kind of spiritual link to that, the myth, mythological, which this, this tool kind of uh, is a deeply rooted kind of species in Georgian culture, right? And it, it refers to that to, to, and visitors may also kind of link themselves spiritually to the legends and, and so on. So that's, that's I, I like that. Do you already have graphic images coming to mind of what you might yeah. use as yeah. graphics? Yeah. 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 Cause what's great about this is it's crossing the bridge be between natural resources and cultural resources. And I think that's great too, because I don't know that there's many other cultural resources along the route. Um, but I'm really glad you brought that in and that's a good point, George and, and Sandy both. So make little stars by those things and uh, keep them in mind for um, for later on. Okay, anyone else want to go? We have time for one more. Thank you. Good job. Well, I, I have, well, again, my, my, my theme is too general, but anyway, if there is anybody, I would... I can, yeah, okay. Then I'll share my screen. Uh, where is my, oh, uh, just give me a second. Uh, okay, so how to share the screen? I uh, I can't see the file which I want to share with you on this. <laughs> okay, let me do it. Let me be, share the screen. Okay, here it is. All right, we see it now, George. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for that. And again, I'm referring to my my theme, which resonates with my soul. I mentioned that before, and this is. General and I'm uh, I'm not a uh, kind of past designer etc. But uh, that's my message. That's oops. Can you see it? Yeah, that's my message to. Okay, it's there now. To visitors, that uh, and uh, I wish you read that, and uh, I'm curious if you are getting my message. If in your feedback, it will be interesting to know. What do folks think? Yeah. This looks like a wayside to interpretation. 
Yeah, I, I like that it uh, gives attention that it's uh, unique, that it's a red, uh, yeah, red list, and it's uh, something, yeah, uh, highlights the uniqueness, and also that, yeah, endangered, what what we are seeing. So we have to protect. Yeah, this is. I like it. George, I like how you're mentioning um, the intellectual facts, the, the tangible facts about the red list and how many species. And then you go to the intangibles and you make a very nice universal concept statement on um, if you love, protect and preserve the nature around you, it will fill you with peace, happiness, joy and healthiness. Yeah. And we're looking yeah. at the more emotional connection there. I like this. I, I see it on um, again, kind of in the introductory area to get people on um, to start thinking about this special place they're going to be entering. You know, the intellectual information, why it's why it's important, and then emotionally how um, the intangibles are are going to be something we hope that you also experience. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very good, George. Okay. Thank you. Let's um let's move on. I'm going to share my screen now. <clears throat> yes, did someone have a comment? Did someone have a comment? Did Ms. Homer have a comment? George is not sure what's I don't see any comments in the chat box, Andrea. OK, all right. Let me bring this up, and uh, we'll get going. So what I'd like to actually start with is um, a little bit of a review from the last couple of days. And remember, we're on to non-personal services now with planning and designing the actual exhibits. Let's go through these fast. If you can just yell out, if you remember, who is the father of interpretation? Do I hear from anybody? I heard somebody say John Muir. Oh, okay. Um, he was one of the early naturalists, but the father of interpretation was Freeman Tilden. Tilden. Remember, yes, yes. Tilden was the journalist that was hired by the National Parks in the 1950s to go around and do a review of yeah, yeah. what was, right. was happening. So that that's important because um, he kind of started it all for our profession. What does KR mean? KR is knowledge of the resource. Yay! How about I.O.? Uh, yeah, anybody else? Because I know the answer, but <laughs> challenging others. Remember the goal of interpretation is to provide the opportunity for people to make their own connections. So I.O. is interpretive it's a, opportunity. opportunity. Okay. Yes. Okay, and this, I just answered my own question. What is the goal of interpretation? We just talked yeah. about it, I.O. Yeah. Interpretive opportunity, right? Right, okay, George, let's, um, <laughs> let's give someone else a chance. Are you guys awake out there? I know it's the evening time Sorry. and it's Friday. <laughs> You're already thinking about the weekend. Okay, what's an intangible? Who wants to go with that one? Something that's not tangible, like theoretical or connected to emotions or, yeah. Um, yeah. So Something what are some examples that people were using in their, in their text? What was an example of an intangible that someone mentioned? It's in non-material things like uh, culture or um, feeling that you get relaxing or something. There you go. That whole thing of, uh, remember we talked about the Japanese forest bathing and sort of that immersion into the environment and how it affects you emotionally, spiritually. All right. Hey, what's a universal concept? Something that can be related to maybe anyone around the world. Correct. 
And what's an interpretive theme? You're not going to get away with this. You're going to hear it from me time and time again. This is only my second day. So, all right, we'll move ahead and we'll come to that. So this is my first attempt at a video. Hi there, it's Andrea again. Welcome to day three of our training. I'm sitting here in my backyard in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I'm looking up at my apricot tree and the hummingbird feeder and the apricots are just getting ripe now. And I've been thinking about our training and the skills we're trying to learn for this Lago Deki interpretive trail project. Um, I'd like to use an example of uh, something fairly personal to me to see if it helps to explain better what we're talking about when we're using interpretive themes based on tangible and intangible connections. So here's my horseradish plant in my garden in my backyard, as I mentioned. And some tangible things about this plant is, first off, it's a perennial. So that means it comes back year after year. You don't have to replant it. And it's one of the first plants in the garden to green up in the spring. Uh, it's got very um, leathery, thick, long, lanceate type of leaves. And of course, at the bottom under the ground is the root where all the good stuff is. So when I come outside, I see this plant almost every day. As far as the intangibles, um, this was a plant from my father who gardened well into his 90s. And it came from his garden in New Jersey to mine here at my first home. And uh, another intangible is that horseradish played a big role in my family traditions. I'm a uh, second generation Ukrainian American. And the use of horseradish root in dishes, especially kielbasa and ham and other things, and especially during the holidays, was a really big part of the family. And I can remember sitting in the kitchen and my dad grinding it up and everyone in tears because the root is so strong. It's very similar to peeling an onion. And uh, just the joy in these silly little tears coming down, these tears of joy and family gathering together and getting ready for holidays and all that entails. So that's a list of the intangibles. The universal concepts I would say would be family, love, connection, culture, ancestors, and let's try and develop a theme out of that. Do you use horseradish a lot in Georgia? Is that part of your food? Uh, it, it's known in Georgia. Kartlop in Shushakria mas. It's a troll, Rusul, Rusul, and Hreni Rukia. I know I sari, Sare, and I said, what we like marginal chance, Potosi. Then we can never work as it what dressing home. Uh, let's from you to trust the other one. So you see how I listed the, the tangibles and then. I thought about it and what it meant to me as far as intangibles. And then the universal concepts, family roots, love, culture, heritage, ancestors. And I came up with my theme. The horseradish plant in my backyard garden is a tangible connection to my Ukrainian American heritage and ancestors. So you see, it can be very simple. I mean, you can get complex also, but it can be a very simple statement connecting those tangibles to the intangibles. So does that help any in describing a little more this process? Yes. May I, a quick question, if I may? Yes. Yeah, I'm too active, but <laughs> sorry for that. But anyway, no, no, please go. So, um, you know, when you are coming, coming up with a theme, so what drives you? Which which part drives you to the formulation of this theme? Of the theme, is it does it come from universal concept or it's a combination of all these? And how how, how you are coming up with the theme from these tangibles, intangibles, and especially universal concept. How you are kind of, what's the path of coming to, to that 
the theme. That's a really good point, George. Um, you don't want your theme to be complex. So I may come up with several themes. I may come up with um, something related to my grandmother and maybe a story she told me. Um, but in this, in this case, because I go out every day to my garden and I see that plant right away, it brings me joy to think of my family background. It brings me horror to know what's going on in Ukraine today. And so it, it opens up a whole lot of things to me. So in this case, because it was very personal, I chose to make that connection about me. Now, in the case of Lagodeki, you're going to be doing things that are maybe outside of your personal realm. So how to choose this is come down with something relatively simple so you can keep it nice and clean and neat. But it's a good point because there's many different ways I could have taken this. And you may want to do a second or a third wayside panel. Not sure what that is. Can we? I'm I'm looking to see whose button is not muted. Okay. Well, it stopped. Okay. Yeah, it stopped. So, George, it's a great observation, and in this case, because it was personal, that's why I went with my family ties. And I was trying to come up with something, you know, totally unrelated to the project subjects that um, would show that this is a fairly simple way to get to the theme without getting too complex. I mean, I've read some themes that are, are go on and on and on, and to me, those are more difficult and starting at this stage, we may want to keep it a little bit simpler. So we, we get used to doing this and used to coming up with the theme that'll um, work for Lago Decky. Okay. All right. So in the profession of interpretation, stories flow from the interpretive themes. The profession uses themes to connect those tangible park resources to the larger ideas, meanings, and values of which they are a part. And this is where we come into um, how does interpretation meet management goals. And when you're at a staff meeting and the budget comes up and they're saying we're going to cut interpretation, you can say, uh, excuse me, but this is what we do so we get visitors who become stewards, who become supporters of our resource. And that sometimes helps to bring credibility to what it is we're doing and why we're doing it and how it benefits park management. Any questions on themes before we move on? You're going to hear them again. You're going to come into them during your, um, your work and design. And I just want to make sure the concept is clear. And then as you get more practice and more exposure, that um, it'll become a little bit easier. And like I said, I still struggle with this. It's, it's a very abstract concept to try and grasp. Any other questions before we move on to a totally different, more intellectual subject? I'm Okay. Yes. We can move on. Okay. So not to say that themes aren't intellectual. It's just um, it's more abstract. I guess is my point. So you've probably all seen wayside exhibits. <clears throat> Ray had a couple examples of some, and um, this is what our goal is for this project. In addition to making this physical trail on the ground, is coming up with interpretive panels for what we're calling wayside exhibits. <clears throat> so there's two types of wayside exhibits. Kind of the traditional is called the low profile, and it is very specific to the landscape and seeing something on the landscape that you are then providing this interpretive opportunity. So they work best when you're out in the resource and you actually see something. And I understand that there's not too many spots on this trail where that may be the case, that we may be talking about the bigger picture of conservation or preservation, um, poaching, environmental degradation. So there are more concepts that we're not actually looking at a tangible resource. So we'll look at that next type and how to uh, work with those. But for the low profile, you're actually looking at that thing 
And then right below you is what we call cantilevered. So it's angled. So you're looking at it and you're able to then learn more about what it is you're looking uh, at. Uh, Andrea, yes. please make it, make it pause here. Sorry, I need to. Sure. Uh, Sorry, just, go uh, for it. Uh, is facilitate Please. All right. So another big part of this project is going to be accessibility and hopefully points that Ray presented to you yesterday will be in the back of your mind when you're doing your planning. But this particular slide of the ranger using a chair, you can see how his knees go underneath the frame. Mm. So that's something to keep in mind when you're designing your panels and more importantly the frames are going to go in is there any obstruction there that would get in the way of someone uh, especially someone that uses a wheelchair uh, that might run into okay the other type are the upright or trailhead wayside exhibits so these are more orientation and so you see we have a map over here um, here we have a whole lot of the um, universal symbols you know, no dogs, no hunting, no rifles, and it probably lists a variety of laws or things here. Not interpretive so much as informational, which is important information to get across to your visitor. You know, how long is the route? Um, will you provide a map right up front so they know this is a loop? What are the other oh, types of safety messages? <laughs> Aris vertical uri, Roman Sats, the anything shaped commercial sets, green the mute set, sifuli orientatia, to Rogavagnut, Sadun Opevit, the Asset Savity orientatia, to Rashi Zleba, Rashi Zleba, Resustam Mimar Tebash, the Swabis Dota Mimar Tebashi. An in shaped commercial of the Sats interpretations, Martent, Ganzoga Debit, and Resustan Ushalot Openis Garish. Please, Andrea. Okay. So I particularly like this one. This is Zion um, National Park. You have a nice big, big image here of, of something along the trail. Then you have some smaller inserts. This is probably talking about the geology. And then down here, you have some even smaller images, letting people know that these are the type of plants that depending upon when they're there, they may, may see. And then the big yellow mark here, I bet that's talking about hazards on the trail, which might be snakes flash flooding, heat, things like that. So it's orientation and important safety information. Okay. So these informational trailhead and orientation panels don't necessarily have a theme. I mean, they're based on the park, of course, and the park resources, but we're not concerned as much uh, of interpretive text as we are getting information out, especially when it comes to safety and, and possible hazards. Actually, <laughs> 
და არც მანდამე შეზღუდულები იყო თქვათ და რატო ვიცით იმიტომ რომ ადამიანი აქ დგას და ასე თქვათ მე და ბრალ დაფასთან გაჩერდება და შეიძლება უფრო მეტი დრო დახარჯოს ვიდრე იმ შემთხვევაში როცაც უშუალოდ იმ საგანძურთან არის please continue okay um it's important that we think about our wayside exhibits in layers and you don't want to get too many layers but just enough to get across your message for that particular panel design is process che chuen kargi ikhneba to tsarmovidgent rom ak ragatsa pena pena gwaks ase tkvat organizebuli es informatsia rats am saintebutatsio panelze unda ikhos andrea so you have your major title your major visual element and your main text and then under that you would have possibly secondary visual element as we did on the safety one with the cactus and the um the birds and the things that may be found so it's a layering experience uh, დასათაურება თავარი ვიზუალური ელემენტი რომელიც ვიზი და ყურადღებას გადამწყვეტი ამ ამ პანელისთვის შემდეგ გუკე მეორე რიგის გარკვეული თემა რაც აქ იქნება შესაბამისი გრაფიკა და ასე შემდეგ შეიძლება იყოს მესამე რიგი და ასეთი ფენა ფენა ზუმის პრინციპი ასე ვთქვათ ადამიანი თავიდან რაღაცას დაინახავს თუ დაინტერესდება მეცზე ჩაღრმავდება თუ კიდე დაინტერესდება კიდე მეცზე და მე დიდხელ უფრო დიდხელ გაჭირდება ანდრია And I found this very interesting. There's actually universities and PhD candidates that do research on this type of stuff. And we have the 333 rule. And depending upon who your visitor is, they have 3 seconds that you have to grab their attention. Maybe they're a little more interested and you have 30 seconds, and maybe they're very interested and you have 3 minutes. um es garqori kulevi shedegia metsame kulevi tsvom adamianebis umetesoba an samtsams kharjavs an shemdeg 20 tsams an samtsot tumtsa giorgi snai gluntis snaeri albat 2 saats da 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 ar da aklev da tu da interesebuda ra anu es aris dakvirba zogadi gazogadeba da amitom gasatvalisenebelia dizainis dros anu am droi droi's limited გაუსიხაზიგ <laughs> and you're spending time putting this all together getting it fabricated getting it shipped getting it installed and the challenge is can you capture that visitor that's going to wait for 3 minutes and look through the panel and get everything out of it they possibly can actually as it garkouli gamotsova gvak ratkhon da zalian did aso tkvat gzalis khvevas გამოვიჩენ იმისთვის რომ ეს პროცესი გავიაროთ მივიდეთ თემამდე შემდეგ ჩამოყალიბდეთ ტექსტი მოიპოვოთ შესაბამისი გრაფიკა დამუშავდეთ საინტერესოდ გაკეთდეთ შემდეგ ეს ჩვენ დიზაინი შესაბამისად ასე თქვათ იყოს მისი წარმოება შესაბამისად მოწოდებული ადგილზე დამონტაჟებული ბევრი შრომა გაწეული და სულ 3-3 წუთი გვექნება იმისთვის რომ ამან ყოველფერმა იმუშაოს ვიზიტორთან so not to not to be discouraging but it just adds to your challenge of making this um be attractive so people want to read the whole thing now remember these are statistics based on the united states i don't know if there's any research in georgia on um, but if you have phd candidates or masters candidates out there looking for a project it'd be interesting to have a review of how visitors interact with your particular wayside panels es statistika amerikul auditoriyaze vats kemorgebuli ik aries gaketebuli sakartovos tvis aseti kuleva ostros chentvis arari tsnobeli tu aries gaketebuli shezeba surati gansvarbulis ikos okay so starting to get into the nitty gritty on 
you have a variety of frames, again, here in the United States, um, or you don't have to use a frame at all. <clears throat> There's techniques where you can print a panel that's almost a half to three quarters of an inch thick, and you don't need a frame, but you need some sort of support. <clears throat> Ես արիս տիպոլոգիա, դիտան ասետ կոտ այմ արխիտեկտուրիս, այմ սայնտեպուկացիո պանելիս, ոգջ է չարջոց հակեմ զատեպա, շնտեք մասեմ մակտեպա, չու են սայնտեպուկացիո դապա, ոգջ է դիտան դապա այսը թիրոմ խողտ and in this case, I'll show you a close-up, but these are extruded aluminum frames. And then we have, as I talked about, the frame list. So it's a thicker material with no frame, but there's a support on the back. And then, we have, and then we have the upright, and that was the orientation trailhead. Where, okay. And then trail side, these might be smaller, and they might just have identification maybe about a particular plant. But they're usually just on the side of the trail, and they're, oh, they're smaller. Or orientation uh, info on that uh, on our behavior, etc. Right? As a tipata da pebits, that's a resistitely certainly a kichma. As Kamui and Evok, she got the team Italian Lagonore informatis twist, Shelevo and Santa Patacio, Shelevo Sauri and Patsu. And then you have frames that allow you to add accessible features. And I think Ray pointed out several of them yesterday where there were tactile maps um, and other things to allow you to support these things so they don't um, get stolen. And uh, you have more um, visual things and more tactile things added to that pen. <laughs> This particular, again, is meant for um, trailheads. It has a little shelter over the top of it. And if you're in an environment, it sounds like Lagodeki might be, that's fairly humid, maybe gets a fair amount of rain and snow. This would protect the panel. And more importantly, it would protect it from the sun. So you may want to think about this at the start of your trail and maybe have several of these panels um, at the introduction, and then if you're going to get into the forest, and the way I understand the scope of work, you're having some experiential stations. You know, you may want to do a larger panel like this so you can cover several different things. <laughs> Andrea? Yes. Um, if I could add your comment sure. about, um, for the, as I'm seeing on the screen, the last uh, little circle with an, with an overhang. Right. Um, I, my comment would be don't underestimate the value of thinking uh, about long-term maintenance. Uh, so that little shed where I live would protect it from the snow. Maybe it, in, in um, Lagodeki, it's from the rain. Um, maybe the visitor could stand underneath that if it's raining and, and spend a little more time there because they're protected from the rain. Um, but in any case, uh, um, protecting your investment um, can save a lot of money down downstream um, 
so that the elements essentially don't destroy um, de destroy your material. And and I would tell you, so I live in a harsh climate. Um, I, I've been involved in, in rebuilding things extremely frequently because the snow, the rain, the cold temperature, uh, or even the sun in some places here, um, just wear things out. So to think about that right at the beginning, which Andrea, you just mentioned, and I'm just trying to emphasize that, think about that right at the beginning and your investment your, um, will last a lot longer if you think through that. I'll stop there. Yeah, very good point, Sandy. Um, where I live at 7,000 feet, we're much closer to the sun. And so the UV damage, we're going to talk about the materials that these panels are built from, but UV rays are one of the more destructive. Um, if I leave something out that's made of plastic, within five to six months, it's already falling apart from the UV light um, destroying the fabric of the material. Okay, also, Barry, Mola Patrono Bose, Massa Lebis Chasabamis for Bose, Climatan, send him Alaska's context to Marijuana, Andre and Tavisi Regionis, it's a privacy tollies, double temperature of his tema, I hope from it at Setquat, the Setwalis in a belly Mola Patrono Bissat's inner star design sheet as a quality in a blood, Andre Shem Privacy Kidesco, Mahali as a quat. Ultra is very famous here, and radiation in this here is that it was a massive bit of a power loss. That's why we have such a famous loss over there. And what is gas at all is in the belly and design is drawn. Massive structure with the titanes and the other stamps are we say can be as read and to can be rogoring rogoring values. Andrea. So I understand that um further into the trail, your plan is to have. Uh, areas where there's activities going on and where maybe these school groups, the youth groups would come in. You might even consider um, having some logs as benches and maybe two or three of these type of little houses so that um, a teacher or a ranger or someone can present a formal program and he has in the backdrop maybe pictures of the animals or whatever the exercise might be at that stop. Okay, so now um, getting back to the bases, um, we talked again about the traditional tea, and then the cantilevered, and then the single pedestal, and um, these are the trail side ones where they could be smaller, maybe they're pointing out a particular plant or um, some other feature, and then the uh -huh. double pedestal, and then you may have a wall somewhere, and if there's a wall to uh, mount this on, uh, or maybe a big rock on, or other materials that are already out there. These are really popular when you're driving, uh, say, along a highway, and you have a pullout, and you already have a rock wall on the edge, maybe of a, a view, and um, they would be mounted then into that wall. And then lastly is the sled. And the thing about the sled is that it's not permanently mounted. Uh, these are heavy enough that your average person is not going to just take off with them. But this really works well if maybe you're having a special event or something seasonal and uh, the seasons change. So maybe this comes out in the winter and it talks about the winter environment. So it, it's more portable. <laughs> Because <laughs> Romel Sukashi de Bassezon Tematica, the Jet Azria Kome Aceti Aceti interpretatis da Pepis Arcebubas, Da and what Kashi de Bara has Honizibas, Melissa Sadgas, and the Baba Shendek, Vivitanza, Kadarita, Teleportatu. Andrea? Okay, so these are just a sampling from one company. Um, the sky's the limit, really, um, with what you have available. 
Are you going to have your, uh, your panels and your frames fabricated in Georgia or in Eastern Europe? Are, are there companies there that do this? Um, but I don't want you to think this is the only ones available. There are other ones um, out there that uh, vary depending upon the company. The digital era really revolutionized on how wayside exhibit panels are fabricated. And I'm going to talk about four different types of processes that, at least in the U.S., are out there to make a good panel. And one of the big things in fabricating a wayside exhibit panel is what kind of inks are going to be used. You have so you have dye-based inks, and that's what you use in your everyday printers, and they are UV resistant for maybe up to five years. Uh, and then you have pigment based ink. So these are natural pigments and they're very UV resistant. So that's ultraviolet resistant. Pigment are they natural pigments or um, they can be but they also can be uh, synthesized yes yeah okay yes and so continue so we're talking about the inks and it's important to have uv resistant inks. So when you're writing up your scope of work for this project to be fabricated, that would be a point you want to star and make a note of, that UV resistant inks be used in the printing. So the fiberglass embedded inkjet, so inkjet, of course, is a type of printer, and we're using UV-resistant inks. On um, Once that paper is printed and then it, it dries, then it's embedded in fiberglass resin and baked at high temperatures. So remember, fiberglass resin is susceptible to degradation from the UV rays. So the UV rays of the sun can damage and break down the resin. And when you expose fiberglass, if you were to touch it, you could get those little pieces of fiberglass in your hand. So you want to make sure that if that's starting to happen, if the resin is on, um, literally it's evaporating and it's exposing those fibers, it's time to replace that panel. So the maintenance is the one of the important um, uh, considerations, right? Andrea? Right, right. And monitoring it to see, yeah. you know, maybe because you're in the forest, there's more shade and you're not getting as much UV whereas another panel might be in the sun. So monitoring and doing regular checkups and just seeing if, you know, did a bird sit on this and leave a deposit? You know, is the tree sap coming down and sticking to it so you can't read it anymore? You know, these are things that the local staff 
are having to will need to put in their daily not daily but say monthly or quarterly schedule so with this process, because it's baked at high temperature, the paper and the resin all become one. So the advantage of this process is it doesn't delaminate. Titan technology and such as the system of Pilpita, that's the number of the best in Titan Masala, San Bochpolans, the barrel temperatures of the pocket, Ertian Masala Titan. So you get good quality images, which is important, and it's a hard surface, and you'll see here the warranty is 10 years. That's just a bamset, Gamus of Lubis Haris Magaliada, Gamzelo Vots Magaliada, at the guarantee at the end of it. So depend upon, depending upon where it's located, you may get more life or less. Okay, now another type is on the high pressure laminate. And this is using uh, phenolic uh, resins, which are a little bit different than the high, than the um, the other one we just talked about, and the same thing here: no delamination, excellent image quality. Uh, there's a high percentage, thirty percent of recycled material, and this is the one that they can make in the thicker version to not need a frame. Uh, Magali Okay, now we have aluminum, and aluminum is uh, printed directly onto the aluminum sheet, and it has a, a clear hard coat on top. Um, the again the strengths are it doesn't delaminate it's excellent image quality and the thing about using aluminum is you can do both sides so I see these commonly in like a botanical garden where you have a little spike that goes in and it mentions the name of the plant or whatever feature is uh, is being recognized there and they're usually um, fairly small but the thing about aluminum I have found is that it's easily scratched. Okay, and again, a warranty of about plus or minus 10 years. Porcelain enamel used to be one of the earlier um, ways we made wayside exhibits. It was one of the early technologies, and it's quite stunning. Uh, very, very crisp, clear images. Uh, it's durable. It's scratch resistant. But boy, if you took a rock and you crack that um, enamel, then it's prone to rusting. It's prone to uh, cracking and pieces falling off. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're very expensive. 
um, but they are beautiful. Vandalism is something I'll, I'll just never understand, and I don't know what the situation is in Georgia, but remember, non-personal services are unattended, so these are out there on their own 24-7. And uh, in Denali National Park, where there's very few trees, the bears would scratch up against the exhibits. And they were strong enough that they would actually bend the, the frame. So you got to think, you know, who in my forest might cause uh, problems and cause some damage. And of course, most likely it's not the animals, it's people. So even though um, porcelain enamel is a beautiful technique, I would say this first time around, you may want to avoid it. Vandalism is something that is not tolerable um <laughs> Uh, actually, my question was about the um, traditional tea and the two pedestals. They were mostly the similar, only difference was kind of the angle of the slope of the board. So Yes, yes. Is it only the angle or there is also some other detail that I missed? Uh, because um, it's too a lot of it is aesthetics and what pleases um, um, the particular particular designer to use, but more importantly, it's what's available. I don't know that you're going to find that much variety in Georgia and, and Eastern Europe, and you may need to kind of modify what it is you're going to be using. But no, there's, there's not a whole lot of difference. It's very subtle. But again, the angle, depending upon what you're looking at in the resource, is it close up so you want less of an angle, or is it looking at Mount McKinley or some mountain peak that's higher up? Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. And George, you had a question? Yes, two quick questions. First relates to, are there any, and I'm coming up with my chemist's background. So, Good for you. Yeah. So are there any specifications for the material, fiberglass resin, for instance, because it should be transparent, etc. right? So. Correct. Are there specifics which which raw material you should use? And then if you could indicate the prices, and now I'm coming from my project manager background, <laughs> I, I should manage my budget, right? So, so the, the price is comparing to relatively similar types of different displays. Very, very good questions. Very important points. The answer is I don't know because um, first off, I've been retired for 12 years. So at least in the States, I have not uh, worked up a budget or researched these particular products. Second is being in Eastern Europe, you or your contractors are gonna need to research what are other sites using, what companies are available. A lot of their chemical formulary is proprietary. So that's secret, quote unquote, mm -hmm. to them. Um, but phenolic resins in general, um, I, I believe there, there might be an industry standard. I mean, you would yeah, know better than, much, okay. than I would being a chemist. But I think that's part of the, the research that's going to need to go into your um, planning efforts. 
And the best thing is, and um, you can maybe even start doing this right away, is find out uh, what other parks in, in Georgia have wayside panels. Uh, what other parks in um, Eastern Europe have these and who was their source? Uh, and it doesn't just have to be a park. I mean, it could be a museum. It could be, yeah. um, you know, just about anything that has these type of exhibits. So you're going to have to do some legwork and um, find out what's available locally. Um, Sandy was telling me about a project he worked on was in Bangladesh, where they found it worked just to ship everything in from the U.S. But, you know, now with the prices and transportation being unreliable, being very expensive, there's so many variables in there that I don't have an answer for you, and you're going to need to to do the research to find out what's going to work best for your budget and your your location and and your uh, site. Okay. Thank you. Zviat, uh, Good evening. Uh, so my question was uh, is a bit similar with uh, what Georgi asked. Uh, now first of all, can you uh, send us or show us lately on the during the presentation the vi visual examples of these technologies that you mentioned so we can at least we could see how they look like. So and also with the can you send us more precise description, for example, uh, in Georgia, there are there are, we have a lack of uh, variety of the technologies uh, of this type. Therefore, I worked on on ma ma many uh, inf infrastructure which requires this type of uh, technologies. And here we we struggled a lot to find even the paint that you mentioned, like the paint should be UV resistant. Okay, you ask that you want the UV resistant paint, but they you don't know if they truly use that type of paint. Well, they would say, yes, we did that, but eventually when we see in two years, we could not read anything on the text. Yes, we had the warranty, we asked them to change it, but eventually it doesn't, it's not effective, right? So uh, therefore, can you can you send us more precise description for all this type of uh, infrastructure that you should ask for someone if you're ordering it you should tell the company i want to ex to uh like this infrastructure or this board should be done in this 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 and this particular way so we can we could kind of take a look and replicate it if it's possible here yeah. Thank you. Yes. Maybe some some kind of sample scope of work or something like that. Right. I, I can look into that. Um, I will have some examples to show you here uh, in, in the uh, future slides, but I will put that in my notebook and see what I can come up with. Um, and it might be because the panels are not super heavy. It's the frames that are, are heavy. It might be you have it printed um, in another country in Europe or even printed in the U.S and that you take care of the frames locally. Um, these are options to explore, and I'm certainly open to helping you uh, get more of that information. But I'm glad you've had personal experience already because um, this helps then to understand what the options are, what the parameters are, and uh, what route you might wanna go. And uh, Andrea, Luca mentioned also, they have experience with the aluminum uh they did this in georgia so they have this technology locally okay um one of the things i did when i first started um working this job um, with the national historic trails is digital printing just became available and so i had a small i designed a 12 by 12 uh, inch wayside panel and we paid to have it printed and I got three or four different companies in and I set them side by side. I even put them up on my roof for full exposure to UV. And then we decided, you know, was there degradation from the UV? Was it fading? Did it hold up? Could I scratch it with my fingernail? Could I scratch it with a rock? You know, could I scratch it with a knife? So I was able to then compare side by side. Now I realized time may be an issue in, in this case. But, um, and, and I don't know what's happened in 12 years and I don't know what's happening in, in Europe. So um, this is something that needs a lot more research and a lot more input from more than just me. 
and we need to get the chemists involved in the um, the scientists and find out you know what what is available now does that answer your question yes yes Andrea, okay. thank you i'm sorry i don't know all the answers i have some of them but not all of them sandy uh, you had your hand up yeah, sandy, i'm sorry go, did you want to translate Pata? No, sandy go ahead please okay so i just want to touch back on the topic of vandalism um so i spent a lot of years um operating alaska state parks several hundred parks all over alaska um so very quickly vandalism is just extremely high cost it just takes one incident to create to, to ruin sometimes entire things um i don't know if this is much of an issue in georgia um but if it is, there are three things that I would recommend you do. The first is observe your vandalism. The second thing is with local park staff, discuss what's happening, discuss the vandalism and particularly where it is and think about where it is relative to motorized vehicles. My point is, if you have a motorized vehicle access to a facility, my experience in the United States is vandalism can be very high, frequent. If, you, if the vandal has to leave the motorized access, the vandalism goes down. And I can tell you that in Alaska, we, just, we determined that the distance was 130 meters. If a facility was 130 meters away from, say, a parking lot, vandalism almost disappeared. What's the point? The point is when we evaluated it, we decided we determined that vandals were lazy. <laughs> they were lazy. And so we would often try to get things 130 meters away from a vehicle. You can't always do that, but it's something to think about. And uh, so observe, discuss and evaluate and think about if there's a, some kind of a distance that you can observe locally. And then if there is, use that information to your benefit. So that's all I want to add. Very good point, Sandy. Especially appreciate your personal experience with this. Um, I you don't should. know if it's an issue in Georgia. Uh, uh, okay, any other questions before we take a, a quick break? Uh, okay, uh, let's meet on the half hour. Um, for me, it's uh, 1030. For you, it's uh, 830, I believe. That's right. Yep. Yes. It's 1230 on the or 1222 on the East Coast. So it'd be 822 in Tbilisi. Yeah, so in, uh, I will meet again in, in seven minutes. I think that's what Andrea said. She froze on my screen. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Seven. Yep. Okay. Andrea, can you hear us? No, I think the her internet is off. You may have to drop off and dial back in, but I'm not sure. I will communicate with her. Um, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you fine, Sandy. Yep. Um, I'll communicate with her in texting and tell her that she's frozen and we can't hear her. Okay, actually, it looks like she may have dropped off on her own. I don't see her okay. box up here anymore.
Okay. Ethan, she knows that the internet froze. And I just asked her, you'll sign back on yes. And she just said yes. Okay, so, great. Um, she'll sign back on. Okay. Oh, hey, Ethan, really quickly with uh, email between you and I. Yep. Um, I don't, I'm clueless as to why we're having a challenge. Um, and I have no idea, um, no idea why that's happening, but um, it's, it's, did you see my message from last night? Um, that showed you what came through to me? Yeah, it came through completely blank. But when I go back into my right. sent box and I look at the email that I forwarded you, it shows the entire body of the text with the graphics and the link to the recording, which is yeah. just so bizarre. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, I have no idea either. Um, but anyway, I'll kind of keep you posted. I think the main point is if there's anything particularly timely or critical, or you're looking for a response from me or something like that, to beware that it may not be working. Or, um, I think it might just be the Zoom emails that I'm forwarding to you because it's got all sorts of funky graphics and things like that. But we are still saving them to the Google Shared site, and my colleague Elizabeth is going to save them in a separate YouTube, or a, yeah, YouTube folder. So we still have them. I just don't understand why you're not able to see what I see on my end. Right. Right. Okay. Well, we could. I mean, I'm happy to deal with all that later. Sure. Um, but. Um, yeah. I just muted tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we can talk about that offline. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's no rush, no, no rush, no crisis. No. Sure. Let's just hope so. Andrea is able to reconnect. I don't see her yet, but we've got a few minutes left. Yeah. Now I'm just looking at the message you sent me this more. Okay. A Andrea is uh, trying now, trying to reconnect now. She's telling me. Um, anyway, I was just saying that you sent me a message this morning, my 3.38, so that would have been like 7.38 a.m. your time, and your whole message came through to, you know, came through to me, it looks totally normal. Yep. Uh, so maybe it is just these, um, these link ones, I don't know. Like I said, I'd be, I, I didn't hear, for, I copied five or six people on that message right. so those two messages and nobody else wrote me back either they didn't read the message or they it came through for them which is yeah odd yeah i i don't know it's over my head <laughs> yeah mine too no <clears throat> so we don't see andrea yet right no nope. correct all right That would be a big bummer if she couldn't reconnect. Yeah. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Shoot. Okay, what do you see now? Uh, we see your shared screen, but we also see your, there we go, perfect. Okay, all right. Yep. So now we've looked at um, Wayside Exhibits a little bit closer. We're gonna even take a closer look now to what is the um, background to our text and to our graphics. So um we I click it over hold on the gun with him out on the center but that's your uh designs. In the US we have um a um media design center at a place called Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. 
Ամերիկիս շերթեպուլ ստատեպիս էրուն պարկեմ սամսախուրս թավիսի ծենտրիակ հարպրսվերիս սախելից, ռոմելի ծորետ հայի ամը սատիտ խեպիտար դակաշիրեպուլի, չակիտարդակաշիրեպուլի, Um, that is the design center in, um, in West Virginia on the east coast of the U.S. And they have lots of designers, writers, um, videographers. They make all the park movies uh, for the most part there. And um, that's where our, our basic information comes from. So this is called a design grid. And when we look at the grid, we see it's broken down into columns. Եխա չվեն խետավ թակ իմ բատես, իմ մոդուլ ուր բատես, ասիտքոտ հրացած նիկանեպց նիզանչ։ So the columns in between, so this is where the text would go, and this in between is called a gutter. Gap, right? A gap, yeah, or a gutter. And so that provides spaces between the lines of text. Ես բատ է, ռոգոտ սկրից, արիս ասկո տեկստիս տույս, խետավ չու աշիակս տավիսի ինտերվալեմի, միստիս ռոնս տեկստ է վերթմանցո շերիուս։ And I sent this to Pata to send to you, and your homework for Monday is going to be to actually start laying out a panel. And those of you with digital skills can do it on the computer, and those of you that don't have access to those skills or equipment or software can just do it manually. Ես գամոգ եկզամնատք են, վիսաց շեսեց լողոգատ էլիտրոնուլատ իմ ուշարեմտ, վիսաց առա ամապեշտավտա կաղակետեմտ ամստությության սարջնավը դավանիպաս։ So when you look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six columns. And your primary text is going to cross no more than two columns. Ուպերվելի սի ուպերվելի սի ուպերվելի հիկիս տեկստուրի նացիլի, իկներ իշեց լեպա եկոս ուրի կոլոնիս սիգանիս։ So how many columns of primary text will this panel have? If we're going to take no more than two columns, how many? Go ahead. Say again. If we're going to have primary text, so uh -huh. that's major primary text, goes across no more than two columns. Right. So how many columns of primary text will a six-column grid allow us? One or two? Three. I heard three. I heard three. three. Yeah. yeah. So remember three. the part Primary text is going to cross two columns, and then there'll be a gutter, there'll be a gap, a space, then a second paragraph with a space, and then a third paragraph. How many columns of secondary text might we have if secondary text takes up one column? Six. Correct. So it could be the text or it could be a graphic. Do you remember on that one orientation panel in Zion, they had six graphics on the bottom. They had six photographs, one in each column. But yet the big picture, the main image, took up all six columns. And we'll get into this in more detail. I know it's a little bit confusing straight off. So here we have what we call bilingual panels. In this case, they're a park in south of Texas, and they're using Spanish as their second language. I am Banel Zut, and I am Oren Ovan Magalitz, and I'm going to go to Texas State, 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 and I'm going to go to Texas State. So if you look at this, if you think about what's in the background, when I started my layout, I had that grid with six columns. So this is a paragraph of primary text, and it's crossing two columns. 
היה מגל זה חדר, כאילו עד לפני שלו בסטקסיה או קולוניאני, זה חדר. And here is a single column. So this is a secondary graphic. And over here they went with a round image, but it still is only in one column. So the background grid is there to help guide your design. It's not 100% critical if the designer comes up with something and they want to cross over. But I'd say for beginners and folks that are just starting out, if you follow the grid, you will end up with a very attractive readable wayside panel. So because this is two languages, here they've treated them equally, and your designers need to decide, will Georgian go first, most likely, will English go first, probably not, but you can see they're equal space. Getting to specifics of text, and this is mainly dealing with English on, I, I can't speak to Georgian, so you'll have to come up with your standards for how you want to present your Georgian text. But if we're going bilingual, I just want to suggest some guidelines for when you're using English. So... Um, so with modern digital word processing, these changes are, are at the flick of a button. It's very easy to change. But I want to suggest several things you avoid. So the first one is center justified. So everything is justified. Every, all the text is justified along a center line. And so it makes for very uneven spacing on the edges, which makes it harder to read. Whereas we go with left justified, everything's nice and even on the left, and rag right. So a lot of research has been done, again, just I'm speaking to the English language here and the English alphabet on what makes something readable. So this is the, the justification that's recommended for English, where it's left justified, rag right. 
ეს მოდელი, როდესაც მარცხენა კიდე არის გასწორებული ინგლისური ენისთვის, ინგლისური ენის საკითხვადობისთვის, როგორც ყველა მარჩენა, ყველაზე მოხერხებული. And then there's full justification which keeps me awake at night. А შემდეგ არის ისეთ ესას თქვა სრულად გასწორებული კიდეები ორივე მხარეს მარცხენა მარჯვენად. And what happens is the computer processor keeps a very tight edge here on the left, but it also does the same on the right. And you'll notice comparing left full justification and left justification, see all the uneven spacing between the um, words? So it slows the reader down. I am sure it is a gasorable text is as Aratanabro and Intervalibis, it is process aperhips. So can you see this spacing here, how uneven that is? Yeah, they all know this because okay. they all work with the, <laughs> with, the, with the office and again, they are good in that. So, so that's Great, I'm easy. glad to hear that. And then we also want to avoid using all capital letters. Usually, uh, if we're going to use them, it would be in a title. Or to highlight something in in the normal text, one word say. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, George. Or to highlight something, one word say in the normal text. Right, right. Yeah, so use it sparingly, I guess is my point. Um, this is a sign, uh, I, I'm not sure, of course, what it says, except um, I just wanted to show you here uh, in the Georgian, it's full justified. And in the English, it's center justified. And it's all uh, all caps. That's the sign that talks about the Ramsar designation, which is the uh, global uh, designation of the wetlands of, of international importance. Uh, I guess you took this in somewhere in in in, 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 in West Georgia, maybe in Kobuliti. Yes, possibly. Um, but I just wanted to show that um, the the text could have been presented in a better way. And how So I found this very interesting. Um, can you read this? Uh, so again, for for reading English, if we get the first letter and the last letter correct, it doesn't necessarily matter what's in between. I mean, this looks like gibberish, but I can read it. And so it's just showing how your brain works. So that's why if we go to all caps or full justification or center justification, it just slows the whole reading process down. Okay, something again that uh, changed with digital word processing, and most of you in the audience, except possibly George and me and Pata and some of the older folks, um, when you used a typewriter, we used two spaces after the period. And with so again, looking at your English translation with um, the typewriter and quote the old days, um, only had the technology to give every single letter equal space. 
So with digital word process, there's proportional spacing. So the bottom line is for English, just use one space after the period. I am uh, spacing channel, uh, the Shorebashi, I am a uh, simple web shoris, I'm uh, the other with the Sasashi, or etc. Uh, Ori Sitsis Ramakanovas, uh, Ori Tunis. Okay, looking at another panel, visualize the background grid. So we have primary text here crossing two columns. And you see how the primary text up here is then divided with a black line. Again, that's a graphic element. And and the secondary information, which is including the maps, which is very helpful. In this case, it's the story of the Trail of Tears from the American East Coast to Oklahoma. Uh, and don't forget your captions. Here again, a bigger graphic. And the secondary maps. Here, the main graphic covers almost the entire panel. So the Trail of Tears, of course, existed before photography, so there were no photographs. But we found some good artists, and we tried to use people from the Cherokee Nation to come up with the art. And so you may end up having to commission art, or you may have someone on your design team that's a good artist. I know in the scope of work, there were some very nice illustrations that were presented. So for readability, good contrast is suggested. So here, um, they lightened the background. And here, they chose a, a lighter spot in the sky to put the text so it could be read. So this layout has a very clean approach, the one main graphic, and if you have your person that's only looking at this for, for three seconds or 30 seconds, hopefully something relatively simple like this will catch their attention so they can get the message. With again the digital world and advances in audio technology, um, we now have the ability to add audio to our particular waysides. And these are things to think about in the future that um, you know, you may not have the money now, but you might want to plan to have an audio description in your, your panel.
Tulia, Magram, Meta da Meta Tulia, Dr. Francisco. Mangus Cabin. You are standing at the edge of the Cottonwood Creek picnic area, facing west, looking toward the Teton Park Road toward a large field. A buck and rail fence encircles the field, and you may see National Park Service horses and mules grazing. On the far side of the field is a small two story brown log cabin. Beyond the field are the low hills of a glacial moraine covered in aspen and lodgepole pine trees, and the Teton Range towers above. The 6 by 12 inch sign is located at the west end of Cottonwood Creek picnic area. The upper portion is text, and the lower portion is a sepia toned image of an elderly man sitting on a stool holding a fishing pole. He has on leather work boots, dungarees, a light colored long sleeve shirt, and a floppy brimmed hat. He has a long flowing gray beard that hangs down his chest. The stool rests on a small patch of grass flanked by shrubs and trees. You can't see the water he's fishing in. It almost looks like he is fishing for trees. So this audio description is tied to the map and the numbers on the map. So as people are standing at that particular spot, they're able to get an audio description of what, if they were able to see what they would be looking at. Um, Ray talked a lot about this yesterday, and there'll be a few other examples I have. But in, in doing my research, it, it turns out there's lots of companies out there that actually will do the audio description for you. Um, um, Pata is going to send you a handout that talks about the guidelines for audio description. And there may not be time if um, you don't have someone on your team that knows how to do this, if it's going to be in your project that that would be something you contract out for. But it's also just in the future to think about because a lot of research, even starting back in, in 2011, they came up with these um, devices that were solar generating electricity. Uh, they worked 24 seven and they were different ways of getting power because unless you have power, these obviously these devices are not gonna work. Um, here's an example where, um, again, it's a solar powered device and it gives an audio description of um, the event they're, they're talking about. This audio after this circuit from the Jelba. It's a complementary, it's a orientation panel, it's a little bit of territory, it's a little bit of a little bit uh, audio texti, troba uh, aset kotiko. Vero te pro signer su tu te marti vada tiko su pro katsos khale boliko surati ko amu grafika stan grafiko ruka stan eto. Saki tiete te dat smisho vanya te tones sikat energiz karo tones mudina dos dot khati shudi os gamartun gomaru boshi ta she sabam sat gamu ikane bakshila tu amish sabaloba. This battery, uh, this panel, uh, Andrew. Okay. Andrew. And I'm going to turn it over to Sandy. He was kind enough to go to the uh, uh, interagency visitor center in Anchorage, and he got down on the ground to get this photograph because the power source was under the panel. So I'm going to let Sandy explain just what it is this device is and what it does. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, so this device, I'm going to hold up a hard drive here. The device on your screen in the picture is about half of the size of this hard drive. So it's very small. Um, it's simply stuck on to the underside of a panel. So this picture, I'm lying on the floor looking straight up. Um, this is an indoor version, but there are outdoor versions that could, could you know, be out of doors in the environment. Um, and so what this is about uh, is Bluetooth, as you can see on the screen, short distance communication from one device to the other. <clears throat> Think of your cell phone. So at the visitor center in Anchorage, there's an application and I'm gonna hold this up because if anybody wants to take a picture of this QR code with their phone right now, <clears throat> you can click on this. This will take you to the application store, and you can download 
the application that the Park Service uses in the United States. Um, you, you, you may or may not want to download it, but the point is you can walk into a visitor center, take a picture of this, get the application, and I can hold this back up if somebody wants it again, um, get the, the free application, and then through that application, your phone will communicate with that device. The device knows where it is. It's at the second panel or the third panel. Um, and uh, a, a question to, to Pata and Ani, did, did they describe this at all when you were at the visitor center in Anchorage? Uh, no, no. No, uh, okay. This wasn't highlighted at all. Okay. Um, so in a nutshell, it's very simple technology. That's, that small device uses a couple of batteries, standard batteries. Uh, they might have to be changed uh, uh, two or three times a year, depending upon the, the temperature, the outdoor temperature. Um, so this is something you could do in the future. Um, and these devices are fairly inexpensive. Uh, and, and if it were of interest, we could later do some research and, you know, guide you, uh, guide you to these things. Um, so somebody with any kind of hearing disability or reading disability um, could simply take their phone, walk down the trail, the device will talk to your phone, the phone will talk to you. Um, so I, that's a description. I think I'll leave it at that for time. Uh, but I, I find it really intriguing use of very simple technology and pretty much everybody has a phone in their pocket these days. So um, it's something out there that uh, has a very low cost and a fairly high payback. Thank, Thank you, you Sandy. Sandy. Sandy's been a part of our team in the background helping with a variety of things. Um, he has been to Georgia before and um, presented training um, with Pata and another uh, co-worker up there. And he lives in Anchorage, Alaska, and he's retired from the Anchorage office. And um, he worked on um, subsistence, which is the local Alaska and Alaska residents um, by law being allowed to hunt and gather and fish within uh, Alaska land. So thank you, Sandy. I appreciate your input. And um, we just have a couple more slides here. Anything else to add to that? OK, so really with just the, just, just uh, but at the end can you display once more this qr code oh sure low technology <laughs> tell me when you have it Thank okay, you. George. All Thank right. Good. So these are things to think about in the future. Um, I'm great to see, are happy to see all this young blood and all these young minds that grew up with cell phones and computers. You know, it's just going to be um, the sky's the limit in what you may come up with. Um, right now, we are limited by time. I'm not sure about funding, but um, definitely keep these things in mind. Um, and then, just in general, when you're thinking about your planning here. Uh, remember, you're confined by a budget. Um, during the planning, you need to think about where are these panels and other things going to be fabricated? Is shipping going to be an issue? You know, right now, globally, there's issues with timing and fuel costs and staffing and many, many other things. And who knows what's out there we don't even know about yet. Um, you need to plan for site preparation. And Larry's going to cover that a lot more next week when he's talking about um, more of the physical um, construction of the trail. Um, who's going to install these? Is your contractor going to do that? Are park staff going to be involved? How about your maintenance? Uh, is someone going to go out and do you have a schedule of maintenance to take a look at the panels and whatever else you may have out along the trail? Um, are they going to clean it? You know, how often are you going to fall in a rhythm? Um, do they need to be cleaned? Is in the springtime when birds are more active? There's more um, bird droppings that need to be clean. And then you need to plan for replacement because eventually they will wear out. And then what happens if there's an earthquake or something happens where the information changes? You want to be able to um, update that. 
whatever, regardless of what it is that happens. But you can see here there's wearing, and where's the wearing, but where people put their hands when they're reading this, they kind of lean against the panel. And that seems to be the most common place where this um, wearing happens. And then the ultimate vandalism, you know, can this paint be taken off with a uh, acetone or some sort of material that's not going to damage the panel? Uh, these are just things you need, need to plan for. So I'll allow some time for questioning. I think we have a little bit of time here, but um, you have a little bit of homework for the weekend. When I join you again for the last time on Monday, we're going to actually physically be laying out a wayside. And I want you to use your text that you've come up with, use your themes, your graphics. And even if this is just a little stick figure, you know, we're just looking at concepts here. We're not looking at a final product. So do your best if you have computer skills to lay this out digitally. And if you don't, then just physically, just draw some columns on some paper. Don't make it more complex than it needs to be. But what I'd like you to do is when you're done, is take a, a digital picture of it and email it to me because then I want to prepare these to present them to the group so we can talk about them and review them on Monday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> To just get the feeling, get the general concept. And like I said, draw a stick figure if you don't have any graphics. Um, don't make it more complicated than it, it sure, needs to be. Sure. So some of you should have already have your text that you wrote for today's homework. And you should be able to insert that. And again, even if you have to handwrite it, but if you can print it out on your computer and then paste it um, just with a glue stick or something on the layout, um, that would be good. We're not looking for perfection. We're just looking for concept, general concept, okay? So we covered a lot of information, a lot of details, a lot of things to, to take into account. And um, remember, this is a learning process. Uh, for some of you, you're starting from scratch. Others are more advanced, so don't be discouraged. Um, but uh, I think it's important everyone get a chance to at least try this. So if nothing else, you have appreciation for what it takes for those people with design skills to come up with an attractive wayside exhibit panel that hopefully visitors spend more than three minutes looking at. Okay, last comments, anyone? Well, I, my, I was thinking about your email address and I, I just made a picture of... Oh, okay, that, that makes sense. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Andrea. You did a great job as usual. Yeah. Well, sorry about the cutting out. I live in a fairly rural area and you can't always depend on the uh, internet. So I changed locations in the house and that seemed to work. So thanks for your patience. We were on break anyway, so it didn't make a difference. Perfect yeah. timing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you. Well, thank thanks, you. everybody. We'll see everybody again on Monday. So, we Have are a great stepping weekend. in. We are stepping in slowly. Slow, slowly. Slowly. I understand, yeah. and and I will. I have all the patience in the world, but like I said, you just got to do it to 